Uh, Good evening, friends. Please keep that uh, passage open in front of you. Um, Most of you are are very or were very good at school, and so I'm sure this doesn't apply to anyone. But can you put your hand up if you've ever been in a really bad parent teacher interview? (laughs) Ben Fraser, that was, I was not expecting that. Um, (laughs) As someone who's also a teacher in parent teacher interviews, one of the things I worked out, I'm now intrigued. One of the things I worked out as a teacher was the key to a bad parent-teacher interview is to prepare well. To say to the kid, this is going to be ugly. I'm going to say some stuff that your parents are going to freak out about and work that through. I'd also call the parents and say, look, it's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. Um, Your kid's got a heartbeat, which is great, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff we need to talk about, okay? And so you kind of prepare everyone for this thing that's going to be awful. I say all that because I think it's really important that you know that tonight is going to be really awful. Okay? What we're looking at in 2 Kings 9 and 10 is awful. More than that, as we look at this nation of Israel and God's judgment on them, they'd been told over and over again, if you walk away from the Lord, it's going to be awful. This is God's people. God's people who he'd rescued out of Egypt as slaves. God's people who he'd brought into the promised land. God's people who he'd kind of lavished blessings and fortune and prosperity on. But they rejected him, the one true living God. They went after idols. They went after false gods. And that's been particularly the case in this current regime, this current evil empire of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and their family. Terrible things have happened to good and godly people. And so when God's judgment comes, as we'll see it come tonight, it is awful, but we can't be surprised. It will be the end of violence the end of this brutality in this evil empire, this, the end of their crimes against humanity. Which brings uh, us to my first point this evening. If you don't need to announce some notes, here's the first point to say, God's judgment is the inevitable consequence for human rebellion. God's judgment is the inevitable consequence for human rebellion. Come back to 2 Kings 9, where we meet... God's agent of judgment, Jehu, this young army commander who becomes the king, the one who will take God's sword of judgment and execute people connected with this evil empire of Ahab's dynasty. Have a look down there, uh, halfway through verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. You shall strike down the house of Ahab your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. Again, I hope you get the impression, this chapter will not be rainbows and unicorns. This new king is is tasked with striking down Ahab, I mean, he's dead now, but his family, his wife and the kids, and anyone who had anything to do with the tyranny of their regime. And look at how the uh, the commanders responded. Verse 13, in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps. They blew their trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. And we're straight into the action. Uh, One of the things I like about Jehu is he doesn't mess about. He's not perfect, but he is focused. He's task-oriented. Um... He hears that Joram, one of Ahab's sons, is in a town called Jezreel. So he jumps in his chariot and races off to meet him. Joram meets him in the field. Look down there, verse 22. Is it peace, Jehu? This is a question that's going to keep coming up in the chapter. Is it peace? Is it peace? When it's very clear, this is not peace. Jehu's not going to mess about with small talk. He hasn't come for tea and scones. Verse 22. What peace can there be? so long as the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many. Um, for those of us who are kind of locals, Australians 
We like small talk. We like avoiding hard conversations. That's not how Jehu rolls, okay? He just straight to the point. And within moments, uh, Joram tries to get away. Jehu shoots him with an arrow. He also then kills his brother, Ahaziah, the king of Judah. So two brothers, one's ruling the northern kingdom of Israel, the other's ruling the um, southern tribes of Judah, and they're both dead very quickly. Jehu races off to the palace of Jezebel, these uh, two kings' mother. As Jezebel sees Jehu arriving, you see there, um, she has a bit of a glow up and calls out to Jehu again, that familiar phrase, is it peace? Her sons had tried this tactic too, but like them, she won't get away with it. Before you can say, put the kettle on, Jezebel's own servants throw her from a high window and she falls to her death. As it was prophesied, her body was eaten by dogs and there wasn't enough of her to bury. Uh, before we roll on to chapter 10, let me say, I think we need to be honest and admit that this is just awful. We don't like reading this. We don't like thinking about it. Um, I'm not sure why that is, particularly there's uh, any number of reasons. For most of us, we've lived through a period of history where there's been unprecedented peace. We haven't had to deal with kind of blood and guts and war like this. Most of us have never even seen a dead body up close. And so we read this and think, how can this be God? How can this be good? Well, how can kind of substituting one violent regime with another violent guy be okay? This world of ancient Israel is so different to our world at this point. In our world, we celebrate tolerance, actually. Our mantra is, it doesn't matter what you do as, so, as long as you are happy. But we have to admit there's something deeply naive about this. See, what happens when personal happiness comes at the cost of others? What happens when my life or your life actually causes harm? Because that's what life was like under this dynasty of Ahab, this brutal and horrendous regime. Think kind of killing fields of Cambodia or Auschwitz. It's just awful. Do you really want God to tolerate injustice and evil forever? Of course we don't. Do we really want God to look on this bloodthirsty regime with indifference? To just kind of stand silently by forever. As awful as God's judgment is here, there is some comfort that God won't ignore terror and evil and idolatry forever. God is not indifferent to evil, He's promised to respond. His judgment is good news for those who suffer. We need to be honest and say, look, tolerance isn't all it's cracked up to be. Because what you do, what I do matters. The way you live actually matters. Our actions will be accounted for. Which brings us to chapter 10 and our second point. Point two there, God's judgment comes to everyone who stands against God's King. Now, by the end of chapter 9, the sword of Jehu has only just started. We kind of, as we just race through chapter 10 now, we see it just this execution go full on. He comes to Ahab's 70 other sons who are scattered throughout Samaria. What he does is he writes to the city officials in all the towns where his sons are. And then he gets back this reply, look at chapter 10, verse 5. We are your servants. We will do all that you tell us. We will not make anyone king. Do whatever is good in your eyes. <laughs> in other words, please don't come and kill us. <laughs> the memo's gone out, Jehu's on the warpath, get behind him. Probably fearing for their lives, they do exactly that. 
But Jehu writes back, verse 6, If you are on my side, if you are ready to obey me, take the heads of your master's sons and come to meet me at Jezreel tomorrow at this time. Um, good to have, you know, finite horizons uh, to make decisions. But they do exactly that. They slaughter the 70 sons, they put their heads in picnic baskets and wander off to Jezreel to meet Jehu. It's this weird scene. These picnic baskets being carried along by these city officials with blood dripping out of them. Verse 11 kind of brings a, a summary verse. So Jehu struck down all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, all his great men and his close friends and his priests until he left him none remaining. Ahab's sons are now dead, Ahab's wife is now dead. The kings of Israel, the king of Judah is dead, but the sword of Jehu is still not finished. See, for God's judgment to be universal, for God to be treating everyone the same, there is another group of people who must experience this judgment. God's judgment was about bringing to bear the consequences for God's people turning their back on Him and turning to the Baal, turning to false gods. And so he pulls off this massive bait and switch in the second half of chapter 10. What he does is he pretends to be a great fan, a great worshipper of Baal. So he announces verse 18, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. Now, therefore, call to me all the prophets of Baal, all his worshippers and all his priests. Let none be missing, for I have a great sacrifice to offer to Baal. The world's greatest party trick is underway. Jehu's planned this great night of praise and worship to Baal, and everyone's got to be there. They put up the billboards, they do the advertising, they organise the merch, the celebrity influencers are running around Israel spruiking this big event. And they come, they come and they come and they come into this big assembly, all the worshippers. And what does Jehu do? He kills all of them. God's judgment comes to everyone who rebels against him. Jehu then burns the place to the ground and to add insult to injury, he turns the place into a public toilet. Just in, case, just in case anyone thought it wasn't clear, the site of Baal worship is now a public toilet. And so verse 28, we have the closing credits. Thus Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel. Now, as I say from time to time, what do we do with this? I, I've been a Christian for over 30 years. I've never once stood in church and sung a song about Jehu. I've never heard a talk about Jehu. I've never seen someone interviewed in church about how they came to faith in Jesus. No one's ever said, oh, I read about Jehu and he was an inspiration and I want my life to be... No, like... How do we have some kind of conversation about what to do with this kind of massive game of this squid game on Israel kind of thing? Well, remember what we've seen. God's coming judgment was inevitable. God's judgment will come on all who stand against God's King. But there's another side to the coin of judgment. If you, if you turn judgment upside down, what you see is God's salvation. See, for all who stand against God's king, there's judgment. But for all who stand with God's king, there is salvation. There is the promise of rescue and safety. People here in chapters 9 and 10 heed the warning of God's coming judgment. So think about them, for example, Joram's watchman back in chapter 9, who went out and had to check out what's going on with this you know, crazy guy in the crazy chariot. Jehu says, oh, no, no. Come with me, ride with me, it's going to be fine. And they do. Or Jezebel's eunuchs. Switching sides. Throwing her out of a top story of the palace. Here's the point. 
when you see that judgment is coming, you have to make a choice. Will you stick with the old regime of sin and death and destruction, or will you switch and stand with the coming king? Which brings us to our final point, get ready for God's coming judgment. So what I want to do for a moment is sort of zoom back from 2 Kings 9 and 10, zoom out from 850 BC. We don't live in ancient Israel, we live in a very different stage of history. We can look at the assessment of Jehu, verse 39, look down at verse 39 in chapter 10. Jehu did not turn aside from the kings of Jeroboam, uh, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, that is, the golden calves were in Bethel and Dan. We can stand back and observe the assessment on Jehu. He did good things. He followed God's instructions to get rid of the Baal. But he wasn't perfect. More than that, he didn't do the job properly. There's still golden calves that people are bowing down to. People still have not turned back to follow the Lord. The God of Israel hadn't been reinstalled. So we read thinking, there's got to be a better way. More than that, there's got to be a better king. 800 years later, we meet that better king. God's perfect king who comes and calls people to repent, to switch sides. Now, of course, most people today don't think about Jesus as a judge. People think that the God of the Old Testament is bloodthirsty and harsh, but the God of the New Testament is so lovely and kind. Can I just remind you that the most, popic, that most popular topic on Jesus' li- lips is the topic of judgment. Of Jesus' 40 parables, more than half of them are about God's coming judgment. Now, of course, Jesus was the most compassionate, kind and loving man who ever walked this planet. But to reduce him to gentle Jesus, meek and mild, ignores what we find in the Gospels. Jesus comes as God's perfect king, absolutely. But as God's perfect king, he must bring both judgment and salvation. As you keep reading through the New Testament, you see this theme emerge over and over again. 2 Kings chapter 5, as Paul reflects on this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There are only two possible outcomes for each of us, judgment or salvation. Or the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. There are two very clear options. There are two very key moments in human history when Jesus comes once to die and rise again, dealing with the problem of sin and death and the devil, and a future point when he will come again to call his people to himself and to judge those who stand against him. God's coming judgment won't be realized in this world. You will not wake up tomorrow morning, or you don't need to wake up tomorrow morning, worrying that someone like Jehu will come kind of waltzing down Oxford Street in a chariot. The judgment of Jesus is a promised and future event that will take take place outside of human history. After Jesus ascended into heaven, it's like God pressed a massive pause button, a delay switch, Yes, Jesus has come. Yes, he's established his kingdom. Yes, he's died and risen. Yes, he's promised to return a second time to judge. What we live in now is this pause, this moment where we wait 
Look at how 2 Peter puts it. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Here's the problem with living in this moment of pause. The problem is, we still experience injustice and pain and suffering. We want to say, God, what are you doing? Why aren't you fixing this? To Peter gives us the answer. Do you see it? He's being patient so that what? He doesn't want anyone to perish, but that all should reach repentance. God's delay is kind. God's patience is, a fruit, is the fruit of his mercy. Uh, friends, come back to where we started. Uh, if it's not too terrifying for you, I mean, I know it's for Ben, but um, think about that bad parent-teacher interview for a moment. Uh, if you can kind of escalate that more significantly to when you sit before the judge of the world, how do you think that will go? It's pretty obvious at that point that he is the judge, he is the king. Will you be on the right side of his judgment? I suspect most of us would say yes to that actually. I understand what it is to be saved by Jesus. I understand what it is to know his grace and mercy. If that's the case, what does waiting well look like? Because waiting in the New Testament is not a passive thing. We don't just kind of do what we want, accumulate what we want to accumulate, get whatever job we want. Like what we do matters, waiting well matters. So look at what Paul says in Ephesians 6. This is the last one. I know we've gone everywhere. Ephesians 6, put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The writers of the New Testament don't want us to be unsure about this. Preparing ourselves for that final day, we will take focus and attention. Now, we don't need the sword of Jehu, but we do need a sword. Ephesians 6 again, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Why? Why do you need the Word of God? It's not to accumulate knowledge. It's not so that you can answer trivia questions about Jehu when they ask who was the fastest driver in the Bible and you can say Jehu. Like that. <laughs> That's an irrelevance. We have the Word of God, we open the Word of God to prepare each other for that final day. So that the Word does its work as we work out, ah, oh, there are idols that I've given into. There are temptations that I need to repent of. There is a work that needs to happen by God's Spirit as we work through the Bible together. Be on guard. Be watchful. Not just for yourself, but as we join together as a family week by week with our Bibles open. Uh, it was pretty awkward this morning at Morning Church. Um, I had to speak on this passage, a vile, awful judgment, but we had a kid's baptism dedication thing, and so we had you know, bucket loads of visitors. And during the week, one of my lovely staff said, James, you're not very good at this, are you? I said, no, no, but what now? Uh, he said, well, you know, probably preaching on 2 Kings 9 and 10 when we've got 1,000 visitors isn't brilliant. And I said, yeah, <laughs> good point. But then, because I try to justify what I do, um, <laughs> I thought, well, actually, no, it is good. As we pray for this small child, we want them to know more than anything else of what is coming. I don't actually care what job they do. I don't care what HSC result they get. I don't care how many HDs they get at uni. I care, we care, 
Not that they'll be found on the right side of history, but they'll be found on the right side of eternity. That's all that matters. Friends, guard your hearts with the Scriptures open, the sword of the Spirit. Shall we pray together? Uh, Father, you know we don't like talking about these things, we don't like talking about judgment and these awful realities and yet we thank you for this warning, we thank you that we can prepare for the judgment to come, we thank you for sending a king who will save us, we pray that in your mercy we might guard ourselves against temptation against idols that will lead us away from him. Use all of us, we pray, to encourage each other to stand ready to meet the Lord Jesus. Amen.